First off, we have uh, Elise Lamott. She is the director of STEM diversity at Tufts University. So please welcome me, you know, help me in welcoming Elise Lamott. <laughs> Like any other day at August Martin High School, Mr. Robinson, a white math teacher who happened to also be the department chair, walked into the classroom. The classroom was full of black and brown students. However, today was not an ordinary day. Mr. Robinson cleared his throat, got our attention, and informed us that we would no longer be learning the calculus that we started with at the beginning of the academic year. The class, of course, broke out into an uproar, wanting to know why. We were asking all these questions. Mr. Robinson finally said that we were not grasping the calculus concepts, and they wanted to teach us concepts that they thought we could understand. Now, as he's explaining the situation, I can feel my face getting hot. But of course, I'm brown-skinned, so you couldn't see me blush. But I was really upset. I began to think about our class. We were told we were the smart students of the school. We were the ones that were enrolled in the science and technology program. So what do you mean we're not grasping these math concepts? So just like that, without any fanfare, without our input, without our parents' input, calculus was now history. Thereafter, time in math class, it went on. It got easier. I completed my homework assignments without a lot of difficulty, but I thought we were being cheated because we were not being challenged. The thought that kept running through my mind was that here is this white man and the math department that he led, and they did not feel that the black and brown students could accomplish this work. He didn't think we were smart enough, and he didn't think that I was smart enough, and he didn't, didn't even try. So this really made me feel that I was powerless. And then we were all stuck in whatever ride the teacher wanted us to go on, and we had no say in this. But every day thereafter, my friends and I, we went to class, went home, did our homework, and we performed well. But I will never forget the one lesson that I learned from Mr. Robinson, and that was that I was not smart enough for the, smart, for the hard stuff. But that is when my I will show you attitude was born. So fast forward to college. I arrived at Northeastern University. Freshman, very excited. We're going to orientation. We're ushered into this very large auditorium and the dean welcomes us and begins to say to us, look to your right, look to your left. Only one of you is gonna be left in this engineering program at the end of the year. So of course me, I kind of smiled internally and smugly said to myself, well, this person over here and this person over here, they're gone, because I know I'm going to be here. So I kind of said goodbye to them and, and just kept it moving. So I arrived at my physics class, first physics class of my freshman year. I say, okay, there's a window over there. It's nice and sunny. I'm going to move over, sit by the window. It's a very large tiered classroom, almost like this auditorium here. I quickly identified the two other women in the class with me. One was a white woman by the name of Angie, and the other was an Indian woman by the name of Nia. We sat together patiently waiting for the professor to arrive. Shortly thereafter that, Professor Nichols, an older, short, white man who happened to also be my academic advisor, walks into the room. He begins to scan the room to see who's in the class, and he pauses as if he's going to start the lecture. However, he stops and looks at us, and he asks very curiously, why are you here? and why are you in my classroom? So of course me, I'm like, well, we're here for physics. You know. But I didn't say that, because I didn't know what to say. So he really didn't even really wait for an answer. He then continued quietly and, and dismissively and said, why don't you go home to your mother's and become either a teacher or a nurse? Now again, what do you do with that? So none of us said anything, because again, I think I was flabbergasted um, and, and very upset, but Again, didn't answer, but I was stewing in my anger, but demonstrating some restraint. I have no idea what was taught that day, even though I sat there and stared at the blackboard and, and him for the hour and five minutes that it took for the class to, to be over. But I was thinking, you know, we're in 1980, not 1950. And was what he said even legal? So after class, I took a deep breath, 
thought about the situation, and I did a beeline to the registrar's office asking for a class transfer. I dropped that class and, and added another class to my, to my registration form and also asked for another academic advisor. But I walked away from this experience feeling exiled from the STEM spaces. However, my I will show you attitude was still running through my head. But truth be told, I didn't know how to show them. That freshman year, I was just trying to figure out how not to drown. It wasn't that I just didn't understand physics, even though I didn't understand physics, but it was really that I didn't understand how to learn in this environment. I kept on doing the things that worked for me in high school, but only doing them with more ferocity. I also didn't feel like I belonged, but I couldn't really worry about that because I really had work to do. So fast forward to the summer. I went home to New York for co-op, and I worked for Con Edison, which was a utility company at the time. First day on the job, I'm assigned to three engineers. Of course, I'm excited. I am walking into the space where we're going to work. I'm excited. I want to contribute, and I want to learn. There are four desks in the space that we're going to be working for the summer. Three of them are already occupied by those three engineers, and there's one desk for me. However, it's in the corner facing a wall. So for that time period, the only thing that really looked at me for that two and a half, three month period of time was that wall. So this time, my I sh will show you kind of attitude. It was a faint echo because now I'm invisible. I returned to Northeastern University in September knowing that I had to attack this school thing a little differently. I realized that what I really didn't know was how to play the college learning game. So my new strategy involved being seen and being seen as someone who's going to work hard to gain this academic knowledge. First day of class, I walked right into class, found the first row, middle seat, that was my seat, that was the power seat. I had, you know, straight beeline to the faculty member there, and then I would proceed for the next hour and five minutes to follow him around the room wherever he went. And I would just stare him down. So I wanted to make sure that he knew I was in that classroom. After class was over, I'd march right over to him, introduce myself, ask when office hours were, and I would um, convince myself to go to office hours every week. Even if I didn't have a question, I would make one up because I wanted him to know who I was and I wanted him to make sure that he understood that I was invested in his class. So this new strategy along with others, it worked most of the time. I became more confident. I worked with more conviction that for me, failure was not an option. I gradually began to care less about what faculty members thought about me, and I really wanted to focus more on doing well academically. But that I will show you attitude and mantra came back loud and steady. It was the rhythm by which I moved and sometimes still move today. It's a familiar voice from my past. So after graduation, I worked in the telecom industry for about 21 years. And I worked there until it got to be a point where it was not as fulfilling as it was in the beginning because there I also got tired of showing them that I belonged and that I was and could be successful. And I was successful. But the one thing that I thought about was that something was broken and it wasn't the telecom network itself. I didn't really understand it yet, but what was broken was the whole system of producing technical professionals. So I left ultimately to pursue a PhD in education. So now here I am, Dr. Elise Davis Lamott, and I think that my role as the director of the Center for STEM Diversity at Tufts University enables, it enables me to remake the traditional power dynamics at play in education. As a high schooler, I felt powerless. When I got to college, I reacted by adopting an empowering stance but I struggled with that limitation. Somehow, I was so unaware of this dynamic that I wasn't even bothered by the dean's introduction to the engineering program as I was when my physics professor was overtly racist, um, sexist. However, weren't both these things the same thing? They were both about power and access. So I spent most of my time trying to figure out how I can be more em empowered, you know, get another sense of empowerment. 
I also worked on trying to resist against systems that are hostile to outsiders, as well as trying to obtain access for myself, and then also providing access for others. However, this is not a long-term solution. For me and others to be empowered in and have access to our learning, the systems of power must be remade to serve all students. So now with the currency of my doctorate and a title at an elite university, I am using my position to provide access to students and to show them that they have power and can assist in changing the systems of power themselves. So a question for you, what if education was not about competition? What if we realized that when one person loses, we all lose? And also, we want to make sure that the system of shameful and the system that is shameful regarding access and the non-availability of, of interaction with students is something that we need to change. Particularly, the systems of shameful racial and gender inequalities. And we've inherited these. And these are not going to change by just adopting a multicultural or an inclusive mindset. So I assert that we need to remake the systems to embrace equity, to embrace collaboration, so that power in and of itself is not so powerful. My learning experiences would have been so much different if my teachers, professors, and advisors saw me as a person who wanted to learn and not just as a receptacle to dump information into. And this is my hope for, for the future of education. And this is the type of administrator, practitioner, and mentor that I strive to be. I want to be able to allow students to embrace their learning and be a, an active member in it. And I do want to leave you with this one thing. I will continue to show you, and I thank you. <laughs>